Welcome, everybody, to the Fall Line with Chaos and Company. We have a special guest tonight with Mr. Eric Lipton. And uh, you're all going to be jealous because he is out at Big Sky in Montana right now. So how is the skiing today? Uh, better than average. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Better than most. I, 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 well, yeah. What I did today was um, the snow belt was the most fun snow. So <laughs> the snow belt. Yeah, the snow belt. That's where I stayed all day. I didn't want to go up on the hill. That line was too long and too many people. It was, it was demolition derby. It's crazy. <laughs> oh, my God. It's, at least so, it wasn't the conveyor belt that gets your butt to the chairlift in the lift line. Do you have one of those things? A little conveyor belt? No, thing? no. You yeah. have one of those? We used to. They took it out. Yeah, now they want to put those in because we have those fixed grips that they want to run, but we're not going to know. So, so folks, we have Mr. Lipton here tonight, and we're going to start way back when he was a little tyke and ask him, hmm. you know, when did you okay. start skiing, man? When did this big adventure start that got you all the way to the national team? <clears throat> um, when did it start? So, well, that's a, t that's a tricky question because, like, my skiing, I mean, I've been skiing since a kid, like many of us, you know, but hmm. the national team journey that's a different topic. So, I mean, how, how far back do you want to go? Like, where, where should we, I tell you what. Oh, where you started way well, back when you were a little kid. Man. All, right, all right. Here's cause I think you can appreciate a piece of this caper. Um, well, I, I think Angela can do no offense, Angela, but something happens in, in, up in I'm, New Hampshire. That dude, is a we're, really we are so past being offended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not that I was <laughs> this, this podcast would have ended five enough. minutes in. Go ahead. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but a big piece of like my skiing origination comes from New Hampshire. Um, up in Cape Verde, Zeckelwood. So let me show the story. So like growing up, I, I never raced growing up. I was just like a kid. I went to, used to go skiing on the weekends and um, I skied at Blue Mountain and Montage. Although I learned to ski at Hunter. Hunter's like where my first turns were because we used to take like family vacations to Hunter. Um, and I remember being in the ski wee program and skiing the West side and being like a three-year-old in the giant power wedge, like, you know, making my way down Claire's way. So like Hunter has this like super soft spot in my heart. Right. And, and, you know, I like got close with the Slutsky family and we just, we went there for many, many years. And, um, but growing up, like in Pennsylvania, I would go to blue mountain. And so, um, the, something happened with the, the lady at the ticket window found out I was from my hometown is Pottsville. And she says to me one day, and I'm like eight years, eight years old. And she says, um, oh, you guys have that chocolate shop there on the corner at Center and Arch Street. And it's called, it's called Moots's Candies. And they have great fudge. And I live like an hour away from the mountain. So it wasn't like a short trip necessarily. But she says, she says, they have great fudge. And I said, well, if I bring you fudge, can I have a free lift ticket? <laughs> and she says, okay. Like I'm a little kid, right? So that started it. So for the next, basically, this went on for like nine years. Every weekend, I would bring her half a pound of fudge from Moots Candies and just give me a free lift ticket at Blue Mountain. Oh, sweet. It was brilliant, right? It was fantastic. Oh. So I totally, to like, totally stumbled into that. So, so you um, learned this whole barter and free ticket thing <laughs> really early before you were a ski instructor. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was a deal. Oh it worked for, work for me. It was great. That's pretty fudge for oh. Fudge for lift tickets. So... Um, so when, when did you evolve into racing? Cause you, you definitely put, put the gates in front of you and went down through the panels. Um, yeah, not until college actually. Yeah. Like I, I, yeah. I really learned to ski before I learned to race. Right. So like I, you know, I, my, went through my certifications like level one and level two and, um, without, you know, really any race experience. Actually, actually I coached racing out of Mount Hood one summer without, not really having much race experience, but having a pretty good technical ski background, you know? Um, and then I got my full cert. Actually, when I was ski racing at Penn State, I skipped training one, one day or one two day period. We had training like Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I skipped training for a day and missed it. And I went up to Hunter to take my full cert exam. So, um, it was definitely like was, was learn to ski and understand skiing before racing. And it wasn't like by design. It just happened. I just wasn't, I didn't grow up racing. You know, I was building jumps and the ski patrol was knocking them down. Like, you know, like just screwing up, you know? Oh man. So, so you, you were more like you. me. When I was <laughs> yeah. I was going to say like, what's like, you guys have a podcast where you kind of go into your stories and stuff. And then like, it's just like being kids, you know? Yep. Yeah. I, I, I 
quit the race team because they stood around waiting to, you know, <laughs> one by one in the panels there. And I'm like, I want to go skiing over there. I mean, the woods looks good. So I just yeah, ran. Like, they're having fun. I'm going to go with those yeah. guys. Exactly. Oh, we got yeah. into big trouble. My dad worked at the mountain because the mountain is just eight miles from here. It's not open now. It's a lost ski area now. But my dad worked there. And yeah, so I used to get in trouble all the time. And uh, finally, he just told the patrol, stop chasing them and just use them, man. <laughs> so, yeah, I started doing sweep with them and stuff at the end of the day. But, yeah, yeah, I, I didn't race till really junior high, high school other than the fun, like, Monday thing or something because I couldn't stand all that training stuff. I just wanted to go skiing. Too much yeah. standing around. We were bump kids. We were bump rats, you know. And, Bumpers, and, yeah. And it was funny back in the, uh, the late 80s, Seven Springs, they started this this crew called Safety Patrol. And they were like, they were, you know, ostensibly to like check lift tickets and things like that. But I think they were just there to bust us. But one of the dudes, Uncle Bob, was like sympathetic to our cause, to our mogul cause. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a shovel. <clears throat> just tell, he's like, just build your, your jumps in the woods so nobody can see you. So <laughs> we got away with that nonsense. But did you guys used to, um, I, don't, I don't know how your setups were like with your chair speed and whatnot, but we found it faster to hike up the hill and take bump runs. So we would hike and bump, hike, ski bumps, hike, ski bumps, hike, ski bumps. Did you guys do that? Or was it chair to the top? Or what was your setup? chair man i had no chairs it was t-bars T -bars. <laughs> there was, no, it was no, no chair it was one gondola that everybody <laughs> stood in line we went to the t-bars man and yeah, nothing we're, but t-bars and rope toe oh well yeah that's we and we had the blue mountain had had a rope toe um but there weren't bumps like we had we had chairlift to the top like they were grooming everything um so we had to build jumps right in order to get air because like seven springs has always had like a bump culture yeah you know, like, for and sure. I remember doing clinics there, you know, not long ago for years and years and years skiing with that school. And there was that little guy with the sweater that would ski bumps down the front side, like mm -hmm. all day, every day. Yeah. And everybody knew this guy, like he was like, like a local legend yep. and looked like, man, he's been doing that. They're like, he's been doing that since 1976. Like never yep. missed a day. Mogul Matt. Yeah. Matt was yeah, a phys ed that, teacher. Yeah. He, sadly, he passed a few years ago, but uh, heard that. there's a whole crew. Um, they're just a crew of those guys. They were all about the same age and they all ski exactly the same way. And they do these, these check turns and they're, they're just beautiful. They're so polished. They're so good <laughs> at those check turns. Yeah. They never fall. They, they never miss a beat, but you're right, Eric, about the culture. Like um, our chairlift configuration whoop, is different now. But there used to be a wooden double that went from the from the bottom up just to the top of Stowe. And it was a really short chair ride. You could lap it all day. And and people were hooting and hollering uh from the chair because there was just so many great bump skiers. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool, man. That was influential. Oh, chair. That's yeah, that's about yeah. as I'm deprived now because yeah. Cause it's everything bumped up. We didn't have those tillers and those big groomers, you know, like when you were young, Eric, I'm older than you, man. They, we hadn't even snow making. It was like, we had to wait for it to snow. We skied across yeah, the mud. You guys yeah, groomed we, with we had, a snowmobile and a chain link fence. Oh, they, they had the old tuckers and Skelly's dad, who was one of the owners back then, I would be out there and they'd have the old tucker and they'd have like a big eight by eight with this humongous chain and a U behind it dragon. That was what they groomed with. Other than the powder makers, they went up with the barrels and stuff. Yeah. It was it's the same setup they groomed the infield with during Little League in the summer. <clears throat> yeah. It's, yeah. Just take it over to the field, man. They're all ready to go. Jeez, crazy. There's still a place that does that, does that but that's another story. Maybe we'll get into <laughs> that later. But yeah. I've been, yeah. Wild. So, um, so, so a lot of people always wonder what we do to get ready and all that. And um, I know you take your skin very seriously in terms of your performance and making sure it's at the top level. And I, and it's for me, I know like asking you what you prepare, I know you're going to say, well, I don't prepare. It's a year round thing for you. I bet. Yeah. Well, that's true, right? Like fitness and active lifestyle is, is just a year round thing, right? Like I, I, I'm an active guy and I try to stay active. And so I don't have like the, Oh, ski season start next week. I need to get, start getting in shape. But like people do that, right? Like yeah. they go, gosh, it's Thanksgiving and I'm going to be skiing in two weeks. I need to get in shape. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I've never had to do that now. Like, I think as we get older though, <clears throat> like it's one thing to say, I believe an active lifestyle and I like the mountain bike and those things are great, but life, like some of those activities do take time and life, life gets in the way and we get older and, and, um, like muscle imbalances happen. So 
it's oftentimes not enough just to kind of reside in the fact and say, resign to say, I have an active lifestyle. I don't need to work out. Like you, you know, you need to like, you need to focus on muscle groups and make sure that you're, that, you know, you're, you're kind of addressing everything. Cause that's how, that's how injuries happen, right? If your quads are strong and your hamstrings are weak or, mm-hmm. you know, you're, 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 you're not stretching enough, you know, Achilles tears happen. Like mm-hmm. the stuff just happens. So, so we have to pay a little more attention. I mean, I, I know I do, and I feel better. I feel better when I'm like really focusing on, on my core, right. For one, cause like, like almost nothing else matters, right. Almost nothing. Else. Like I know when I'm strong through the core and that means like from my hip flexors and my upper quad through, through like, like, upper abs, but it's also lower back. And it's like, it's really like the, the mid body mm-hmm. that I feel strong everywhere. You know, um, I know you guys give like Erickson a hard time. He's like, I ah, goes to the gym and I hanging out at the gym and the gym rat. <laughs> but like the fact is like, you know, like attention to specific body parts and having a regimen like that, it, it helps a lot of people and it, and it can really prevent injury, especially as you age. Yeah. You know, no, no matter what, position erickson talk we were going to take the opposite yes we were <laughs> yes we were <laughs> so um yeah so but do you have because you're um you 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 come across as a very disciplined human do you ever just like wake up one day and like you're like you know what i'm doing al bundy sweatpants hand in the front eating a pizza you ever do that six pack like, in the front like binge watch a Netflix series. I know you do it, man. Yeah, I do. Of course I do. Right. Like, <laughs> I, like I haven't, I'm not, I like to think of myself as relatively disciplined. That doesn't, that doesn't mean I'm like, I have no, I can't relax. Like there's an ebb and flow to it, you know, where like I go six or eight weeks or three months and I'm like really working out hard. And then I just kind of like fall off. And, and, and honestly, it happens a lot in the fall and I, I'm, I kind of prepare for it because we get busy in the fall with planning and there's a lot of like office work and there's a lot of like just getting ready for the season. Um, and, and then with snow operating, like like the fall is a very busy time. So I kind of know that that's going to happen, mm-hmm. but if I'm strong going into it, like those blips in the road don't matter. If I'm weak going into it, it just exacerbates. Like it's like the person that says, well, I have a really strict diet and on Thanksgiving, I can't even overeat mm-hmm. or I can never have a slice of pizza. But if you have like a, a relatively disciplined regimen and you eat well most of the time, you can have a slice of pizza. Yeah, you can overeat. You can sit on the couch for a day. Um, it, it doesn't, right, doesn't throw you off that much, right? <laughs> I think, you know, I, it, it, <laughs> Angela it, goes, I just got permission. <laughs> like I needed that permission sitting here slugging a beer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what the hell was I going to say? I can't even. Oh, I know what I was going to say. This this could be me totally justifying that behavior, but I think it's good for you too, though. Like it's you know, I, I, blowing off steam is good for the soul. You know, it's it's good to just let it yeah no let doubt. it hang out. You know, every once in a while, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. but like here's something that so what's so many fun? Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, please. No, go ahead. So well, I was just going to, I was just going to ask you what some of your fun lifestyle stuff is. You know, I know you go hiking a lot and you know, what's some of the stuff yeah. you've been out West now, like permanent. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mountain bike a lot. Um, the biking out here, I live other than park city, Utah now. And the biking is insane. And I just mean, it's so good. Not that everything's super steep, but there's so much of it. And it's like a gold star Imba mountain bike area. Like there's 450 miles of single track. It's unreal. It's like, and, and there's trail, trail foundations that maintain the trails, you know, and, um, and like, it's well-funded. It's, 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 it's a fantastic place for mountain biking. So, um, that's a big part. So mountain biking and hiking. And then like this year, like we all did, I went out and like bought a new, like, you know, summer sport thing. So I bought like some stand up paddle boards and now I'm getting into stand up paddle boarding, um, which is really relaxing, you know, to go out on the water in the morning. Um, but mountain biking is kind of becoming, it's hard not to, like, it's just, everybody does it out here and it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. It's so much fun. But the other thing is I take up skateboarding, like stand up skateboarding. (laughs) Yeah. That's what (laughs) he said. You're going to take up skateboarding. He was in with, I'm going to come out. Oh, take up skateboarding. I still have a skateboard, but 
you know, it's funny because the guy who lives across the street from me <clears throat> is like a retired pro skateboarder too. Hmm. And he has like, he had a pro model of a board, you know? Um, and he's like getting back into it and he's doing film shoots and he's got like a, a pit viper sponsorship now with the glasses and everything. <laughs> and he's like, they're like, his name's Jake DeVries. They're like, Oh, Jake's back. Like he's, you know, and he used to be a pro skateboarder. So he's always bugging me to come out and try it. But he comes flying down in front of our house is like 90 miles an hour with his hair on fire. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. Was there a, was there a skateboard scene in Pottsville so, so when you were growing up? No, no, not really. I mean, it was me and my friend, like, you know, lying on her, on her backs, like, uh, oh, yeah. um, what is that? Like, la- like luge, you know, <laughs> flying down the <laughs> roads and yep. drivers flying by calling our parents saying, do you know what your sons are doing? <laughs> <laughs> so I remember, I remember something I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think about till just now that I remember from seeing this fall that uh, you, you start mentioning the house and going by. It's like, you did some pretty cool stuff for Halloween there. Oh yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is totally like a, a like a got a one up the neighbor kind of thing. This was really yeah. fun. So I go outside and I see he like it's a COVID Halloween, right? So everyone's like, how do we how do we do with the kid? Who can come to the door? All this thing. And so my my neighbor, not this not the skateboarder, but the guy two door, two doors down, goes from his second story. He gets like some like t- two twelve foot sections of PVC pipe, <laughs> links them together, and he has like a, a candy slide. Where he like drops it out of the second floor window and the candy slides down the, 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 the pipe onto a table that's decorated in lights and the kids get it there. <laughs> and so I see this and it's like, it's like 10 a.m. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. All right, <laughs> game on. Yeah. That's on now. <laughs> I'll see your candy slide and I'll raise you a candy catapult. <laughs> so I spent the rest of like, spent a couple hours like building a catapult <laughs> in my garage. <laughs> oh, man. and we were able to launch candy from like our driveway down into the road it was probably like like 30 feet probably probably go farther we were having cars drive by we were like launching it into the window it became a game like <laughs> like and they loved it so you know oh man I, I i when i saw that when my wife showed me on facebook i'm like okay there's a little bit something going on there's something got him inspired and little, i can see it's a little <laughs> competitive edge they're not beat me on this one man i'm gonna get <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, did you, man, did you yeah, like change was... did you change it up like if it was somebody you liked it was like something soft like marshmallows but if it was somebody you didn't <laughs> oh, like, like get the get the gobstoppers out <laughs> yeah 100 percent. 100 percent Oh man, too yeah. funny. Mm-hmm. All right. So, so, you know, the, the question I guarantee people out there that are going to listen, want to know is, is uh, when you see good skiing, what is it that you see? And not just the five fundamentals, you know, Matt's good at that. Matt like picks a fundamental. I mean, what excites yeah. you? What excites you or you go, I mean, I've been out on the hill and kind of seen you going, hey, there's some good skiing watching somebody. I mean, people want to know, what do you see? What, what excites you about skiing, watching somebody? Uh, yeah. So like, you mean great skiing, right? Like yeah. great skiing. Yeah. Um, it's rare. Let's just say that. Like yeah. it's rare. Um, but I'd say three things. So accuracy, athleticism, and grace. And the third one's kind of curious, right? Like yeah. grace or elegance. But it like that doesn't mean it doesn't mean fragile or dainty. It just means like fluid and um and with great touch you know like not erratic not harsh like a like a dance you know like a well choreographed dance and i did a podcast with george thomas about touch on snow Mm -hmm. and that's so rare and so special like but when you see a skier with touch it's like instantly recognizable right it's like there's a lot of athletic skiers and a lot of accurate skiers. Um, and, and so those two things, I mean, those two things are great. Like, you know, accuracy and athleticism, that alone is like, that's great. But then there's, there's the ones that you feel like just flow with the mountain, like, and you're like, okay, that is really different. Like there's something very special there, you know, and, and it's, it's super rare. <laughs> Do you think that's something that can be developed? Or do you think that's inherent? Oh, it's like, is it nature or nurture? Yeah. Um, no, I think y- you can learn it. Mm-hmm. Right. Like for sure. For sure. It just takes, it, it takes like an awareness and a sensitivity 
to feeling the snow and f- and like i swear I, I i feel like we have we have some skiers you know and I, some members some instructors out there who can't tell if their skis are skidding or carving like and but when some some skiers can like really feel the snow and and it's the difference between like you know between edge angle you know edge angle 1 to 1.25 to 3.3 to 3.4 whatever whatever your gauge is there um it's not like low edge angle mid edge angle high it's it's like the second hand of a clock it's those notches and the same with pressure it's not shifting pressure from foot to foot all the time but it's the ability to like to like slowly pour pressure and, and redistribute in in a really um careful and meaningful way that's like that's touch you know it's like feeling the snow and giving the ski what it needs not just what you know the next position or the next mechanic is in your movement pattern does that make sense yeah and and you know we had matt and jeb on very recently and and matt brought up the same example that there are folks who can't distinguish between whether their own gear is is carving or skidding and i wonder what you think about um well uh, let me ask you a question do you agree that we like as an organization are very body centric in our in oh my our, god okay yeah like that's yes. the understatement of the century yes of course we are um <laughs> see that was a loaded question yes, I you're on to answer that <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, so um do you do you think so what it sounds like is these folks who have grace as you describe it are very good at looking at the external environment like we focus on the internal environment. Do you think that as an organization, if we shifted our, if we shifted our rhetoric to include more of the gear itself, more of the ski, more of the snowboard, and also more of the snow and the pitch and reading terrain, we could, we could alter that, um, on a large scale? Um, yes, I, I think that's, it's fair to say that, but there's more to it than that. Like that's, a, that's a little simplified. Um, you do know who you're dealing with here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep it simple for you fellas. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cliff's notes, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because like, there's like when, fe- so step one is like feeling the snow. Here's what the ski is doing on the snow. But then step two is how am I affecting what's the ski is doing on the snow? So it does translate into the body. Okay. I have to do something different with my body to get a different result. So, you know, yes, we should be more ski aware. I wrote an article about this a few years ago um, with like racers versus instructors. And, and that's definitely true, you know, where like the racers, especially at the high level, we're doing some US ski team stuff. And, and um, like their coaches are always saying, you know, flex your ankles, flex your ankles. I don't really get it. And I'm like, well, the result, here's what you want the ski to do. Get the ski to do X. And like, okay, I can, I understand that. And I don't know how I do it with my body, but I get the ski to do X. So like if, if we were more aware of what the ski does on the snow, yes, I think it would help, but we have to be able to connect the dots. Also our challenge or one of our many challenges is that we're so body centric and that we, and I, and I say, we like as an education staff, as higher educators, cause let's face it, like our, our cert process dictates our culture. So the certification tree is what is what determines like like curriculum and content it's like and it shouldn't be that case like certification track is one thing but understanding ski and ski education is way broader and should be right like the things we test on are just one little slice of that but oftentimes what we test on becomes what we are all about and and stop me if i'm if i'm i'm rambling on guys but like, oh, we like it because I, I mean, it, I like it because it was something you said a few years ago when you were still here in the East with us. We got to ski with you more um, that um, someone in the group, I think we might have been doing something about snow and the group, you and I. And you said somebody was saying, well, my ski just does it automatic. And you just kind of sat back and went, my ski does not do anything on its own. <laughs> it has to come from me. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's kind of where you're saying that yes, that we need to understand what the ski is possible of because you you and then you talk to them about like the skill the ski can't have skills, 
<laughs> right. <laughs> right. I don't know if you remember you saying that. It doesn't have a brain of its own. Yeah. Not the that's air. right. Yeah. It's like, right. it's like it has to have some input from something. That's me. And my ski <laughs> does what I tell it. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> I, and I, anyway, I, like, I, I'm sorry. Dinner. I, I love, I just, you ask. So I, I love what you're saying. And I have, yeah. I have brought this up many times with many people, friends of ours, all of ours on this call who, who can speak to a, to a, uh, uh, you know, speak at the highest level. Say, how do we account for style? Because I fully agree with you, Eric. We we account for technique, but we don't account for style as an organization. And you know, since you brought up eighty skateboarders um, back in the day, there. And this, but this is this is my background. You know, we were talking about like, you know, what what informs us. Um, back in the day, when I was a bump skier. And, and we were hiking up the hill and kind of making fun of the race club kids because they were standing on the hill and we were skiing it. You know, we had Glenn Plake in the back of our mind. And that dude is a terrific skier and has been forever. But he was also style, hands down. I remember an ad in a, in like ski magazine. He had three polo, polo shirts on, all different colors, all very bright and all the collars were popped. And we were like, hell yeah, like, look at that is, you know, of course his hair. Right. But back in the day in, in skateboarding, which is what, what my, my culture was, there was the, the, the Tony Hawk Christian Hasoy war. And it was a, it was a, you know, friendly, sometimes not so friendly rivalry between the two greats in competitive skateboarding at time. And at the time, Tony Hawk was all tricks, technical shit that you, he would finger flip the board or kick flip the board or varial the board so many times and so fast you couldn't even see what was happening, you know, but he's gawky and long and it just was weird looking, it's not like a praying mantis, you know, and Christian Hasoy was, had hair down to his butt and his whole run would consist of five airs, but he's 14 feet in the air completely mm -hmm. tweaked out in this beautiful ballet of an aerial and all power and grace, like you said, right? And as I got involved with PSIA, that has always stood out to me, what you're saying. I'm sorry, this is long, but I'm just coming back to what you were saying is that we are very, very good at accounting for technique. But I believe, and I could be wrong, we would have to collect data. I believe more people ski for the style part of it for the aesthetic, you know, and for the vibe than for the technique. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, the vibe part, especially, yeah. you know, the, the, uh, and I might be getting this mixing things up a little bit. I feel like, was it the Austrians? Yeah. A couple of years ago, the Austrians adopted, readopted their old technique, like feet close together, um, kind of a little more swivel in the hips and what we would consider like a really old style. Right, like not high edge angle, not carving, not not big forces, not bending skis, but but shuffle, you know, shuffling, you know, just kind of maneuver because that's what their guests want. So now they're teaching that stuff more often. And the moment we get detached from what the guest wants, like the is the moment we become irrelevant. So we we have to continue to check ourselves. Like, are we teaching what guests want to learn? And and one of the one of the uh, indicators, one of the litmus tests is like, do they come back? Right. And and as an industry, we know, like, I mean, there's lots of factors, but, but in teaching, like talking about style and technique and, and the content of our lessons and, and ultimately then our certification ladder, are we in line with what our guests want? You know, they're, they're the ultimate judge, you know? So based on the conversion rate, I would say no. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, it, it gets, it, the conversations kind of blend together, but yeah, the, like yeah. there's a lot of factors for that. I'd love to talk about, but I don't want to. Well, I do have to say that, you know, one, one, one of the things that really impresses me about you, Eric, and, and, it, and to be honest, it surprised me a little bit and I'm not sure why <laughs> it did, but it did. Well, thank you very little. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, wait to hear what I have to say. Um, uh, you, at the beginning of this mess that we're in now with this pandemic, um, I followed what you were doing. I mean, and you and I and you and I have had correspondence through snow operating, but mm -hmm. I've also, you know, been on uh, 
Sam calls that you were on and things like that. And it just really impressed me. I thought you were the most vocal person I heard who was willing to just throw away the old models yeah. and just say, what are we going to do now? Like, what, what do we have that works? And let's, let's take this opportunity to get rid of these things that aren't working, you know? And I was really impressed by the way you did that. And I'm just curious, like what your thoughts are now, you know, maybe we're looking at a vaccine and people are talking about next season being back, you know, to, to closer to normal. Like, what are your thoughts about that? Do you, do you want us to go back to normal? Yeah. Oh, well, I, I appreciate the compliment. Thank you for the kind words. And um, yeah, so I feel like, gosh, what's the normal? We're never like, some things are never coming back, right? Like one way this has, you know, one of the silver linings in this for the ski industry has been you know, an acceleration of digital adoption. So for, for an industry that has traditionally resented technology, has, you know, shunned the monitors, the screens, like we're the opposite, come outside, get into nature. Um, we are like fully dependent on it now, right? We're doing reservation systems and call ahead and you can't walk up and buy a lift, lift ticket and you have to reserve, you know, ski and snowboard school ahead of time. Um, it's all, like any resort who was was like, you know, delaying their digital adoption has been forced to, you know, to get with the times. Right. And the, the mantra, like, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Like now it's like, if it ain't broken, break it because the problems of tomorrow, the challenges of tomorrow, if today can't be solved with the solutions of yesterday, like this, it, it is a new world. And, um, and it's as good an opportunity for a resort or for an instructor to, to you know, start doing things they've always wanted to try, and to stop doing things that don't serve them. So, like now is a chance to to try new things. Well, we've always wanted to see if that works. Like let's let's battle test it. Let's take it on the road and see if it if it's a go. Because in the next five years, guys, three thousand years of industry experience. Like there are resort owner, there's resort ownership. There's management that is trying to retire. They want to get out, and there's going to be a huge opportunity. For, for young people who are interested in leadership roles of all sorts to make a difference and to, to propel us into the modern era um, in all ways of, of resort management and leadership and um, you know, in everything we do. So there's a great opportunity for people who are willing to try new things. You know, How much of that do you think we need in um, our own organization? I mean... What are some thoughts on like, you know, what do we need to do to inspire our membership to be better or, or different or match our match what our students want more? Yeah, a great. That's a great question. Right. And, and like, this is the stuff that, you know, people, our membership sits around and talks about in the bar every day. Right. And I, I don't, I don't yeah. think to have all the answers, but I'll say that, that our jobs as, as instructors, we have to recognize that it's way more than, than technique or than developing skills. Like we're, we're the chief stewards of our industry. And, and the idea of like the mantra of safety, fun and learning, it's more relevant than ever before. Like it's the oldest mantra we like, it goes back decades in PSIA and ASI. And it's, it's like, it's that order, safety, fun and learning. And, and you can say, well, it's fun to learn things. Yes, it's true, but skill development is not, necessarily the what's fun for everybody you know like having a good time on snow can come in a lot of you know forms and, and ways and factors you know so i feel like um that's where like we we need to be thinking like we need to shut our mouth and we need to take people on adventures in the mountains um and that's true at the beginner level and that's true at, at every level right less talking more sliding um connecting with people and teaching them how to be skiers and snowboarders, not just how to ski and snowboard, like sharing our culture and what makes this, what makes this a lifestyle, not just a, a hobby, you know, because for most people, this is just one of the many things. It's just an activity. Like it's like bowling for the day or it's like, Oh, we, we try, you know, we went skiing once this year, but if we want to bring people into our culture, bring them in and put our arm around them figuratively, we need to like help them see what is special about the mountain experience. 
And we need to not shy away from technology. Like it's got to be integrated. Let's find a way to integrate technology into what we're doing, not to say it's us or them. Again, I, you know, I'm on a soapbox a little bit, but um, uh, it's well put though. Dude. Yeah, seriously. Mm. And it's, it's kind, kind of, of pushing you there, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I could see that. Yeah. It's coming from an informed place, though. If yeah. every like, if every first timer at the end of the day said that was fun, our sport would be growing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. but they yeah. don't. They go, that was cold. That was painful. That was frustrating. I'm freezing. That was scary. Right. Yeah. If we just had more fun. Yeah. Right. So, did you ever snowboard, Eric? Yeah, yeah. I, ha- I it's been a, it's been a long time actually, yeah. but I do have a snowboard. And, uh, and I enjoy it and I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty okay. Yeah. Pretty not bad. Pretty not bad. <laughs> yeah. pretty not bad. <laughs> Mildly <laughs> mediocre. <laughs> kind of. uh, you do the baggy pants and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's hard. Cause like I, I have a lot of Alpine stuff. So like, I, I think I kind of look like an Alpine guy when I'm a snowboard. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't have the, <laughs> you put the, you put a speaker, <laughs> you put a speaker in your backpack and bump tunes and lift line. <laughs> not does generally that, does should. that does that happen does that happen anywhere else do you guys see that at your at your areas yes. people getting left line more more. it's blasting mm. it's in a luck man I, yeah. I i'm fully prepared to admit that i'm getting old but i that bugs the hell out of me you know i think it's awesome and i'm like <laughs> dude is that a triple xl <laughs> oh man yeah oh um well when it comes down to having fun and uh yeah. How does Eric Lipton <laughs> like to be coached? You know, what does it take to get your interest? What does somebody have to do to go, yeah, I want to go listen to what that person's talking about skiing or doing on the hill? Um, when I, I'm going to listen to him. Uh, I, okay, so how do I like to be coached? Is that the yeah. question? Yeah, yeah kind of. How do you like to be coached? Or, you know, if there's someone doing something, maybe not even coaches, someone's doing something, you're like, oh, I'm interested in that. I want to hear more what they're doing and maybe I'll look at that. Well, if I'm watching them ski, like if they're accurate, athletic and graceful, I'm like, okay, like that's, that's cool. Like that's uh want to need more of that in my life. Right. Um, if it's like coaching, like I, I self coach a lot. Um, if there's a video camera or someone's got photos, that's cool to, to see. I mean, like, like the three of us, like we're, we're on, you know, on the other side of the camera more often than we're in front of it. Like we're behind the camera, you know, just the way it goes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but often like from a coaching standpoint, you know, I, I might say like, I have a sense, like I do a lot of self-analysis. I feel it. Okay. I didn't like what the ski did. I did like what the ski did. Not so much there. I think it's cause I'm doing this. And then I might say to somebody, Hey, watch this in my skiing. Just tell me if it happens. Yes, no, or sometimes. Right. So it's really clear. And then when they answer, then I'm like, I'm either confirmed. And then I continue the analysis, the self-analysis. Um, if it's like, listen to what somebody has to say, <clears throat> I, I want to hear original thought, um, like no platitudes, you know? And, and um, I'm kind of like, I don't just want to hear people like recite the fundamentals, you know? Um, because I know what they are, like help write them. Um, <laughs> shit, that was my next thing. I was going to recite the fundamentals. <laughs> He's been studying them all week so he can say them for you. I've been memorizing those word yeah. by word, you know, but like they and they're they're all they're super overarching, right? But it the conversation has to be deeper than that. So those those are fundamental concepts. And sometimes I say, you know, the fundamental concepts, and people are like, oh, you mean the five up? Yeah. And like they're they're meant to describe anything you can do on a pair of skis can be can live within one of those buckets, but it's our job as instructors and as higher educators to interpret those for people. Like we can't just say to a, you know, or we shouldn't just say to a student, um, you know, Hey, uh, you know, control pressure foot to foot and direct more to the outside ski. Will you? It's like, okay, no, but we say like, what that means to you is level your shoulders out because it will help you direct pressure to the outside ski. Hey, shorten your inside leg because it'll it'll put more weight on your outside foot. Or hey, you know, um, you know, raise the inside half of your body or feel the pinch. Or like, and for each of our students, we go and we translate or we interpret that fundamental for them specifically. Or we put them in a situation that causes that to happen. Right. So like that's when it gets really interesting, you know, and that's where we can be loose, right? Like if we're tight on that concept, yes, we all agree that that concept's really important. 
tight on the concept, loose on the detail, you can, you can achieve that concept in a lot of ways, different in this snow, different in that snow. I don't know if I'm answering it's, your question. No, you, you, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you did. And it's interesting right because Matt, Matt said the same thing when, when, when. Really? Matt, I didn't even listen to that podcast, but <laughs> Matt and I think, I think, thanks, think yeah, about thanks, bro. Yeah. I thanks, think he's just copying your the, answers. Thanks for the here. support. Yeah, I, mean, I wrote all this stuff for him years ago. He's just reciting it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the, the question, I don't, I think he's going to want to beat your ass a little bit. Um, the, the <laughs> question. That was a joke. People. He's, don't, he's, he's not serious, lost a finger. Matt. <laughs> the the uh, the follow up question for Matt is one that I'll ask you. When did that happen for you? Because one of the things that we we talked about when we did have Matt and Jeb on was that our uh, it's more common in our organization for people to seek answers from the outside. But there are those folks who self coach, and when when does that happen? I think the way we phrased it was when does somebody have permission to self coach, right? But um, and that was a whole conversation, but for you, when, when did you flip that switch? And you said, you know what, I'm going to do this on my own now and get, uh, get confirmation, but it's about me now. Yeah. You know, really good, qu- really good question. Angela. very thoughtful. I'm surprised. <laughs> He's good at that. I wasn't expecting that from you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> know what you said to me earlier? Um, no, that's what you said right. to me earlier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from the, it was from the very beginning, like. I, I, I've been a student of skiing for from the like from the very start. I have notebooks full of stuff from from college, from be, from high school. Like I feel this, I wonder this. Like just being curious. What if I do this? What result do I get? You know, what part of the turn do I want to feel this? What part of the turn do I want to feel that? Well, it worked here, it didn't work there. You know, and and you get more confident um, self prescribing. Um, you know, and I have, you know, like I feel less need to check as often, you know, but I, I think that for me anyway, it wasn't like a time where I'm like, okay, I know enough about skiing now. I can figure this out on my own. I was, I've always been trying to figure it out on my own. Here, I'll tell you a story. I was, (laughs) I was in 2003, I'm teaching skiing in Portillo, Chile. Right. And, um, and Rogan's the snow sports school director. And I'm skiing this like main run of Portillo and the ski keeps breaking loose at the bottom of the turn. And um, <laughs> I, I keep making short turns over and over and I'm trying not to get the ski to break loose, trying not to get this little, this little ab stem was happening. It was just it really irritating me. And I ski down to Rogan and I'm like, God, the ski's cutting loose. And he goes, you know, I, I think you're just, I think you're just rotating at the bottom of the turn a little bit. And I go, Hmm, I don't know if that's it, but I get, I keep skiing. And I say like, no, I think I'm just, I think I'm just a little back at the bottom, like on that one, on that, on that one uh, ski. He goes, no, you're just rotating a little bit. And I ski down to him again, you know, and this goes on for like, like a few days or a week or something. Like a couple days later, I'm like, no, you know what it is? I think I'm just like, I don't have enough weight on it. He's like, no, you're just rotating a little bit. And I ski down again. And he goes, I said, I think I'm kind of leaning in. He finally grabs me by the shoulder. She goes, you can think whatever you want. I'm telling you, you're rotating. <laughs> <laughs> and there were, there were some colorful words in there, you know, yeah. called me a few names, but, but I was trying to figure it out. Like I, I was like, I was in the self-analysis, self-coaching mindset yeah. then. Um, and sometimes you need people to say, to, you know, to check in with, to say, yeah. I think this is what I feel. What do you think? And if we all did that, we'd be better. Like this whole thing about I'm going to ski down. And you're just going to tell me what I need to know. <laughs> and then we, as our educators, all of a sudden, call are going, well, what, what are you trying to do? And then the answer that we don't want to hear, what we often get is, I don't know. What should I be trying to do? Mm-hmm. And then the conversation goes circular, right? Like we want people to take ownership of their own skiing and have goals and, and, and be students of the sport so that those conversations become much more interesting. Oh, you're trying to get this to happen. Okay. If that's your intention, then try this pathway. Oh, you're trying to get the, okay. That makes a lot of sense. This might help. But if it's just, Hey, I'm coming down. I want to be a good skier. Watch me ski. What should I do? Like you, the com- it's such a broad thing. You know, that's a terrific response. I think, like, thank you for that. Seriously, because I, I think we all need to hear that. But I, I think 
you know, I would love for our entire membership to hear that. You know, it's okay to be curious. It's okay to have thoughts. It's okay to have goals of your own. You know? Yeah. It's not, I mean, it's better than okay. Like it's what it should be. Yeah. If indeed. you want to grow and be better at something, you know, it's great to have a coach, but that, that coach should be challenging you to figure it out. Right. We're not trying to create dependency. We're trying to create people who like we're trying to build skiers. Eric, I see you switch drinks there. What are you doing now? I, yeah, you're very observant. Yeah. This is a, um, <laughs> This is a, a Bitburger. It's a, a German premium Pilsner. It is a fine beer. Yeah. Uh, so lo- level with me. It's just you and me here, right? Mm-hmm. Level with me. Do you like Yingling? Oh, of course. I mean, I grew up on it. Like I started drinking that <laughs> when I was 12. Wait. I say um, yeah. You know, it's, I'm glad you said because I'm, I'm from Pottsville, right? And our only claim to fame is Yingling beer. We brew Yingling beer. And people are like, oh, yeah, Pottsville. But the lager has gotten all the acclaim. But the fact is they have like six or maybe seven, even seven brews now. Mm-hmm. And in Pottsville, we drink premium. We drink premium, uh, Yingling premium. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a very like, you know, unknown brew. But very few people drink lager in town. Hmm. But yet, like when you go out in the rest of the world, it's only lager. Hmm. That's interesting, interesting fun fact there for you. How do you how do you feel about the Yingling Hershey's hybrid? Have you had that? I haven't had that one. You know, being out here in the West, it's mm-hmm. you know, I'm a little out of touch the last when couple you, of years. When you come home, we'll toast that up. Hey, toast and up. incidentally, Dave, again, again, yes. twice in a row. There's a lot of Pennsylvania on this call, dude. Yes, there is. There is, and they and they keep leaving Pennsylvania though. Yeah, well, we'll come back. <laughs> so, hey, Eric, you've been on the national team for 13 years. <laughs> yes, and you are. Yeah, you are not trying out again this time. I think think a lot of people are, are wondering why. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, I, thirteen years. It's um, what do I have to say about that? Well, I I never thought of myself. I never thought I would be a career team member, and I think that that surprises a lot of people because in in kind of in the modern era, when someone makes the national team. They try like heck to to keep their job to stay on it, you know. And and I can see why. Like it's a wonderful journey. Like it's an incredible opportunity to make a difference. Um, but I, I feel really good about my time on the team, and and I feel really good about you know retiring from the team and moving on to other things. Like, um, I think a lot of people thought I would stay on because I I made the team relatively young, um, and I've been I've been pretty prolific. Uh, in in the industry, I've been I've been on the road a lot, right? I've been like a, a road warrior for a long time. And I just feel like there's more, there's other things to do, right? Like our industry, you know, the more time you spend on, on the team and, and you get to see like all sides, like all area regions, and and it's a it's a wonderful launch pad because you get to meet people from at every level of management, every aspect of our industry, and you get to really learn about the industry from a different vantage point. And you see that how many, how much opportunity there is to make a difference in other places, you know, not just on snow, um, but to have an influence in other ways. And for me, that's, you know, that's fantastic. I, I think there's like, I can use my skill set and have an impact on a, on a, on a broader, different scale. So I feel really good about like what I've accomplished, what I've been with, you know, been with the team and, I've skied with a lot of people and been to a lot of ski areas and it's been amazing. And it's not done. Like I'm not going anywhere. I'm just moving into a different side of the industry. Like, like a lot of past team members have. And, and if we can get, if we have, you know, team members in leadership roles around the industry, um, I think it, it's, it's good because we come from a service side of the business. We come from a guest experience side of the business. Where years ago, people who were in resorts, people who were in the in the management and leadership of our industry were operators, like were grooming and mountain ops and lift and snowmaking and like knew the operations of our business. And that's still critical. But having leadership that has a guest experience, guest service side to them, um, or guest service centric, uh, guest service centric 
piece to their personality and the leadership style, I think is really healthy for the industry moving forward. So it's a long winded way. What do you think? What do you think will happen to the value of your trading card? <laughs> I've, I've seen like, it on I eBay. On my, I my rookie card. You're trying yeah. to figure out like if yeah. you should trade it or. Hang well, I'm, no, I saw it on eBay, dude. It's just right now, like no offense. It's just not worth that much. Mm. <laughs> Gosh. Well, yeah, fingers right. crossed. Fingers you should, you should swap it for Bitcoin because I hear Bitcoin <laughs> is on fire. on fire, blowing up. Do you want to talk about Snow operating for a minute? You're the chief operating yeah. officer of Snow operating, and I, that's a yeah. terrific thing that's happening. Yeah, that's so. Like that's an example. Like I love the work we're doing at Snow Operating. So this is, I feel like for me, I have like two two passions in the, in the ski industry, right? Like one is stoking the core, right? So like our core participants getting them, continuing to get them pumped about skiing, get them psyched. And, and as an industry, we're really good at this side. Okay. So more on that in a minute. So stoking the core and then growing the core. Like how do we, how do we foster growth and bring more people in, you know? And so growing the core is like our critical mission at Snow Operating. We're all about growing our sports. Like how do we, how do we bring people in and have them stay in the industry? Because as, as you guys, no, Angela, I know you're well aware of this because we work together in, in a lot of ways in this regard. Um, but like less than 20% of people who try skiing and snowboarding for the first time come back. Like 80% never do this again. And it's crazy. It's a crazy statistic. It's, it's a horrifying statistic. If we were in the restaurant business and 80 of 100 people who came into our restaurant never came back, like we'd be out of business so quick. It, but in the ski industry, we, we've seen that for years. And, you know, in 40 years, since 1978, 79, when, when the NSA started tracking participation, we haven't grown. Like the graph goes sideways. It doesn't, doesn't do this. It doesn't even like slightly do that. And right now, right now we're at a, like a critical precipice where we have the second largest generation in American history, the baby boomers that are aging out of the sport. And the largest generation, millennials, are not coming in and staying in, right? And, and as these baby boomers continue to leave, if we don't replace them with a population group that adopts the skiing and somewhere that sticks with it, it's, it's going to be disastrous for our sport. And what that means in real terms is like, there's less skier visits, there's less people skiing and snowboarding, and, and more ski areas close. Um, and there's less revenue and just the wheels start to slow. Like we come to a screeching halt. So we need, we need to grow the sport. And, um, the work we do at Snow Operating is all about creating a fun experience, animating things, making the, lowering the hassle factor for people and luring people in and saying like, this is, this can be easy, you know, but like resorts are like have so many resorts are guilty of doing things in a certain way because that's the way they've always been done. And we like break that like processes have never been designed. They've kind of evolved a little over time. Like, well, for 50 years, we've been doing it that way. And we changed it 35 years ago because it was easier for Paulie because it, it didn't hurt his back so much. So we changed the process. So he could be, and I'm like, that's the way we're still doing things. Like with that kind of that in mind, like the, this is so hard for the guests to make three stops, to pull their wallet out 15 times, to have a two hour wait in the rental shop. Like we, like lunacy. Oh, the family's coming and they want to stay together. But you're saying, okay, mom goes over there because she's a skier at this level. Dad goes over there because he's a snowboarder at this level and the kids are different. Age, so we split them all up. All the family wants to do is stay together. All these, these like focusing on the guest. Like we need to, again, we need to break our processes and redesign them in a way. So, mm -hmm. sorry, I, I get so excited about this and I just go on and on and on. But yeah, so that's, that's what we do at Snow Operating. We design processes for the ski industry that make it more fun and inviting and, and a experience that people actually want to come back to. Not that they leave at the end of the day and go, God, that was cold, painful, frustrating. I'm never doing that again. And it was too darn expensive. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's terrific. And and this is a this is a statistic that will that will mean something to you. Uh, another friend of mine, Eric, another Eric Martin owns a rafting outfitters in Ohio pile, Pennsylvania, which is kind of a, a Mecca of whitewater. 
And over the summer, during this crazy summer, he looked at me one day and he said, do you know that 80% of our business this summer is return business? So it was the exact opposite. We would kill for that. Yes. But, yeah. and, and, and I think it can be as simple as the family gets out of the car in the parking lot. They walk in, somebody confirms the reservation and they get in the same boat and they get on the river. You know, it's a beautiful thing. It, yeah. He runs a good business. I mean, that's amazing. Yes. Wow. No, he does. So Eric, if you were, if you were going to design a really quick training process, like a, like a simple one, two hit for ski pros, like, you guys need to change your thought process and how you want to get better. And you got to get better at these one or two things or three. What would it be? What's your top on your list really? to say, we need to do this better as ski pros and snowboard pros. Okay. So that's a loaded question, right? Because it's like, it takes, it takes, a, this is a, this is a giant cruise ship. It takes a while to turn yeah. this thing, right? Like <laughs> it, it doesn't turn on a dime. It's not as agile as Angelo and David Caper and are on skis. So yeah, well, it's, uh, <laughs> it takes a while to make this turn. Imagine you're on a downhill ski. Like it's like, okay, I'm going to need a little room here and a little time to get this thing around. <laughs> Turning. <laughs> <laughs> like those super G skis you did at training, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Those things are surprisingly good. You know, I tell you, if you guys have a chance to get on a, a like a super G ski or a 30 meter GS ski, they're, they're so good. It makes everything else seem like they're good. You just want to see us get scared. Anyway, well, that's yeah, that's a vibe. That's, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. That, no doubt that'll happen. You fall over a couple times. <laughs> um, yeah, it's tr It's tough questions like a train program, like do this and we'll all be better. It starts with the resorts. You know, instructors can make a difference on snow. And I would say if that's what we're talking about, like how do we make a difference yeah. on snow for our guests? We have to animate that experience. We have to um, make it more about fun. Um, and, and I know that some people probably listen to this going, well, you know, it, it is fun and I'm a fun person to be around. But here's how you can, here, here's some, like a real concrete way to think about that. Go out and watch um, your your buddy instructor or or a couple of different colleagues teach a beginner lesson, and with a stopwatch. And I want you to actually time and record how many minutes their guests are actually sliding on snow in a one hour lesson. Actually, collect data, okay? Because what we do too much in our industry is we make decisions intuitively, not analytically, right? And so, collect data. And capture how much time the instructor, the guest is actually sliding on snow because that's fun and that's what they paid for. And yes, your stories are cool and, and every instructor has to bring their own personality to their lesson. And I totally understand that. But a lot of time is spent walking and waiting, um, you know, and waiting for other people to go walking to different sections. You know, the, like the first ride on the magic carpet is fun for the guests, but probably not every time. So, so not all of that is high value. The high value is sliding on snow. Okay. And I think if we double it, that's a good start. But really capture the data. How many minutes? Have someone do it for you in an hour lesson. And if they come back, they say, you know what? This, uh, you know, you had eight people or maybe this year, it's COVID, maybe you only have four or five in, in a COVID world. Um, and I was really tracking John because he was like the average person. Um, he only slid for like four minutes. You know, it was, it was three seconds at a time and it happened a couple of times, four minutes in an hour or four minutes in a 90 minute lesson. That's not what John's paying for. He's paying to slide on snow. So okay. that's what I would say. You know, the first thing I would say is hire us, incorporate train based learning, <laughs> in, you know, yeah. um, Absolutely. But at the very least. For the instructor's purview, they don't always have, you know, the influence of all the other aspects of the resort, but, but slide more. Yeah. Good stuff. And, um, how about your ski camps? I imagine those are fun. You're still going to be doing those. I hope maybe. More. Oh yeah. Oh dude. They're amazing. <laughs> like we have so much fun. So we go to Chile, <clears throat> we go to Portillo and, um, and we've gone to Valle Nevado too. So we have, we have two locations down there that, that we like to visit. And, and, you know, talk about an adventure for people in it. Like it's, it's an adventure because it's a foreign country. They speak Spanish, you know, the, but 
it's an adventure in the terrain. The it's a beautiful backdrop of the Andes Mountains. They're magnificent. It's a like such a unique experience. The skiing is fantastic. The coaching is world class. So, you know, come with me for seven days um, with me and my coaches. So, um, Kaylin Richardson's one of our coaches. She's a two time Olympian, um, uh, alpine skier for the US ski team. She's been in multiple Warren Miller films, I think like eight. She's fantastic to hang out with, great storyteller. Um, and, uh, and, uh, AJ Oliver is one of our coaches. We just have an awesome time. Um, and the coaches are world-class. The terrain is fantastic. And the vistas are super bueno. It's like, you, you can't imagine. It's like Angelo's ready, man. He's, he's, he's ready to go right now. He's retired. Yeah. And ready. Oh, I'm sold. I've been, I've been knocking ready. that door yeah. for years. Yeah. You know, Wiz comes down with us. Dave Wiznesi comes down with us. He has an awesome time. He brought his kids down one year. Like huh. it's such a, ch- it's such a charming the resorts are such a charming place, especially Portillo. It's so special. And, and if you if you've ever dreamed of doing that, of of skiing south of the equator, of coming to Chile, like I, I'd love the opportunity to show your listeners around there. Um, and we take care of everything. You know, we, we tell them when to arrive at the airport, so they arrive at the Santiago airport at a certain window, book this certain flight. That's we find them at the airport. We take care of everything else. They don't have to. We are the travel agent. Everything. Take care of getting them to the resort and. Book and lodge, like everything. It's it's super simple. It's plug and chug, and they just enjoy it. Like what a cool vacation! And that swag bag, dude. Swag bag, best in the industry, like <laughs> bar none. I can confidently <laughs> say, like our swag bag is like mm. top shelf. Like, no one's even close. No one's even, <laughs> close. <laughs> no one's even close. On a bag with Angelo's design on there, we did a new graphic. It's can you believe it? Killer. Yeah. Can you so, believe it? So, yeah. Eric, who's been the biggest cheerleader, biggest supporter of yours the whole way through for you? Who's been that person? You go, man, glad I had them around. Gosh, that's. Well, I mean, the answer is, the answer is frankly, it's easy. It's my dad. Right. <laughs> and, and you guys have met my dad. You know, he. Yes. He's been he's been an instructor it's full cert for 52 years. Um. And so this is what I was what I was commenting on earlier in the in in the call, Dave was uh, when I got into skiing. So my dad learned to ski, and this will be quick. He learned to ski in Franconia, New Hampshire, uh. and Paul Villar taught my dad to ski. And he worked for Paul Villar at his ski school. Um, and Paul Villar taught him to ski, and he became really good friends with Paul and Paula. And Mid- at Midler Sill and Cannon and worked there through college. He went to Franconia College. Yeah. And for your listeners, if they're not familiar with, who, with Paul Villar, he was one of the founders of PSI ASI, PSI in the days. He was one of those seven guys in that initial picture um, from May 1st, uh, 1961 in Whitefish, Montana, when PSI was established. And he was the first technical director of PSIA. So he taught my dad to ski. And, oh, and cool. you know, he's been like, you know, in my corner, encouraging me to do all these things for so long. So he for sure has been the cheer- biggest cheerleader, but like it takes a village, right? You don't get, you don't achieve on your own, like skiing or otherwise. And, you know, our ed staff in the Eastern Division has been incredibly like helpful and supportive along my journey. You know, like Shostak encouraging me to try for a dev team. And, and, and murmur, you know, just like helping me find new ways to look at skiing. And Sean Smith actually, um, was the coach of the team for a long time has been an incredible mentor. I mean, there's so many, like I should probably should have mentioned names because I'm bound to forget people. Um, you know, Rogan has been great. Like, um, it, it's, uh, it's been an unbelievable journey, right? And, and no one gets there. No one gets there alone. You know, cool. Well, hey, this was good, man. We could keep going. We're going to have to have you back on because there's there's more questions. I know I have. have and if I have them, I guarantee Angelo has more. Well, I <laughs> yeah, think look, Eric, this is fun. I think Eric's going to be our, and we're going to do Eric Lipton, the miniseries. Yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I do have one yeah. question, man. When's that mustache coming back? Oh, yeah. Dude, yeah I that, don't know if that's good. Dude, I, that, <laughs> that. The mustache was, in the gondola, man. That mustache was <laughs> I know. boss. That was boss. <laughs> I drug that out longer than I think she would have liked. 
I don't I don't think she would have given you a minute past what she could tolerate. She'd have been like out of here into like mid December. (laughs) That's awesome. Well, unbelievable. Thanks a lot for coming and chatting with us, Eric. And we're definitely gonna want to have you back. I know the folks out there listening will definitely want to have you back. Yes, sir. Yeah, happy to. This was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get guys. to ski before the winter's over if we get to. If not this year, we got to ski next year. Yeah, we got to ski. I, lo- I love what you guys are doing here. This is a this is a really cool thing, and I, I think um, it can bring people into a conversation that can be daunting, you know. And oftentimes at the event, like the access to the Ed staff can be hard to come by for a lot of you know PSI ASI members and. Like this, this is a really relaxed venue and, and easy to hear what you think without them feeling like they're on the spot at an event in front of a group asking a question. So I think it's, um, I think what you're doing is really, really cool. So good job. Thank you. Sir. Keep yeah. up. Thank you. Good work, and, guys. And we have drinks. Yes, we definitely. I'm, I'm empty. I got to refill. <laughs> It's totally chill. This is what the skiing is, is about, right? Like, just yeah. relax and let's yeah. chat. Yeah, yeah. we're, we're figuring we're gonna do, we're gonna try to do next. We want to do because next year, hopefully, we get back to somewhat of somewhat back to being with each other and uh, maybe have a live broadcast at ProGen. Yep, of the pot. Yeah. That'd be cool. Stream the cool. stream the cast. We get you and your dad on there together. That would be yeah. Crazy. There you go. Right. right. What a <laughs> that, that that could be. That could backfire, guys. Well, we don't have to. We don't have to. Yeah, probably not at us. Maybe I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you stay safe, Eric. Thanks for yeah, thank you. Great to see you. Stay safe. Happy New Year. Yeah.